Thank you very much. And as the last speaker, the, our chairman has asked me to try to synthesize some of the things that have been said and uh, hopefully encourage the discussion with you. First, I, I must say it's a, a great honor to be invited to this forum, and it's a pleasure to share this panel with distinguished friends and, and colleagues. Professor Kaku has reminded me that we must keep an open mind. Professor El Nagar has brought up the spiritual long-term implications for all of mankind of the search for life in the universe. Um, Stanton Friedman has told us that the future is not an extrapolation of the past. The Nick Pope just reminded us that there are also financial, very uh, clear uh, financial incentives for continuing the search beyond the frontier. Um, I'm a, I bring a, a different perspective to this. Uh, I'm a general partner in the Venture Capital Fund in Silicon Valley. Over the years, we've invested in over 60 high technology startups, ranging from nanomaterials and um, uh, database software to surgical robots and biotechnology and genomics. One third of these companies are now publicly traded on, on NASDAQ. And certainly the main lesson from me is that uh, technology is indeed accelerating, as the previous speakers have pointed out, at an, increasing, uh, at an increasing pace. And we must keep an open mind to seize the next wave of technology development. Aside from these professional activities, I've maintained a keen interest in UFO phenomenon for about 50 years. First as an astronomer and later as a high technology investor because it presents the kind of anomaly that leads to new concepts in science. In other words, even if we don't have a complete explanation in the next few years or decades, the data is so compelling that it can lead to disruptive breakthrough. The phenomenon is very complex. So the first thing a scientist has to do is to refrain from premature conclusions. It would be dangerous to, to jump to conclusions too early. But uh, together with my colleague, uh, Dr. Eric Davis from the Institute of Advanced Studies in Austin in Texas, I've proposed a few years ago a six layer model to guide the analysis of the observations. We have new things to observe in terms of physics. We have new things to observe in terms of what we've called anti-physics, for lack of a better term. Uh, Professor Kaku uh, wrote a book on the physics of the impossible that has been really an inspiration to me. And I think the UFO phenomenon gives us examples of, of some things that today are impossible in physics, but might be possible in the next few years or decades. There is a profound psychological impact of the observation on the witnesses that we do not understand completely. There are also physiological impacts that we need to learn from. For example, paralysis uh, and a number of other physiological uh, effects that we don't have time to go into, but are well documented in the uh, literature. And then there are psychic impacts in terms of the impact on the consciousness of the witnesses and then there are deep cultural impacts as well. To, uh, to make it more concrete, uh, I'd like to give you just two examples of actual data from our files. Actually, this first case is from the files of the French Air Force. A French aircraft was flying near Dijon. This was in March 1977, before they were very advanced uh, remotely piloted vehicles and like the Predator and so on. And he saw a, as you can see from uh, on, the, on the graph, he saw a very powerful light coming from his three o'clock position, very quickly closing him on him, uh, clo closing in on, on his trajectory. He did an evasive maneuver by diving and turning. The object placed itself on his tail and followed him which was very annoying to this pilot. This was a military aircraft. And uh, again, he took evasive action. The object flew off to his left, did an amazingly uh, powerful 
uh, turn at a very, very high G. Uh, there was, a, he thought there was a dark, a large dark object behind the light itself. It came back and it came again and did it again from his three o'clock position. Again, he evaded by, by an extreme maneuver and then the object flew off. Well, you might say, well, it's just one pilot. Uh, but this is a plane that was, uh, this was a Mirage 4, it's a strategic bomber. And this was followed on radar and it was seen from the ground. The whole thing was watched from the ground by a uh, law enforcement officer in France who actually did the, the main report. Uh, this is very hard to explain in terms of natural phenomena. It cannot be brushed off as just an error of perception by the pilot. The, a similar thing had happened in the French files back in 1956 over Orly Airport, and these are concentric circles of five kilometers around Orly. Over a period of uh, over an hour, four airliners, the pilots and the crews, described an object very similar to, to the object seen by the Mirage. This object literally jumped from one corner of the sky of Paris, tracked by radar, seen from the ground, and seen by four airliners. It was tracked at over 2,000 miles an hour. I don't need to remind you that in 1956, there was nothing like that, and there is still nothing that can do this today. This is the kind of data that much of the scientific community has not seen, has not taken the trouble to, to be exposed to. And this is perhaps this panel, maybe the first breakthrough in bringing this to the attention of the, um, of the scientific community. The phenomenon is very robust. I'm not going to bore you with statistics, but when you do statistical data, uh, analysis of databases, and we have today 11 detailed databases from global cases, that I've been uh, tracking and analyzing, you find extraordinary similarities in the time of day, the duration, the type of light, and, and so on. And we can learn a lot from this. We can do science on this without prejudging what the ultimate answer is going to be. So my conclusion is that reports of a phenomenon can be studied objectively with the methods of today's science. For example, we have started to look at residue from these cases. There are a number of cases where we have metallic residue that have been analyzed, and we're beginning to, to understand why it would make sense for an advanced um, technology to use these particular metals in that particular combination. Um, we also can analyze the light. We know how to compute light output from given uh, sightings where there is a calibration of the light that the object gave off. And we have started to do this kind, of, this kind of analysis and look for patterns. This is high school physics. This is not general relativity. This is not very advanced you know, string theory. This is something that we could do today. The science has not been done yet, and it needs to be done. There are ancient cases. I uh, just published a book called Wonders in the Sky, about 500 cases unexplained before the Industrial Revolution. These need to be looked at. There is high sighting frequency and the appearance of physical and biological anomalies. All this argues for bold new theories. The, beyond the limited polarization between the, the science fiction view of ET and the academic skepticism. So UFO reports may provide, we're not ready to invest, I must, I must say on behalf of my partners in Silicon Valley, we're not ready to invest in UFO research but somebody should begin to look at different types of analyses of this phenomenon because it can provide an existence theorem for new notions of space and time and breakthroughs in technological innovation. Thank you very much.